Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. I do thank you for taking time to be busy today to watch your videos. I pray that our studies in the Word of God and studies in the history of the faith be a blessing to those who are following along. Friends, we preach that which would be known as Baptist Doctrine. I am a Baptist by faith and practice. And that means simply this, that the Bible, well, doesn't matter which one I pick up there, they're both the same, King James Bibles, the Bible is the final rule of all faith and practice for true believers. God sent a man, and that man was named John. God told him to go forth and baptize with baptism and repentance. And they began to call him the Baptist. That Baptist preceded the Lord by six months in birth. He leapt for joy. That Baptist in his mother's womb leapt with joy at the knowledge that Mary would carry the Savior. That Baptist went forth doing the will of God. Great multitudes went out to see him. He baptized many in the, by immersion in water in the River Jordan. That's where baptism starts. That's where this Baptist faith and message starts. Friends, the Lord Jesus Christ crossed the desert some 60 miles on that burning sand to get to John to ask of him baptism. And when John seeing him, he said, But I have need of thee to be baptized of thee. And the Lord says, Suffer to be so to fulfill all righteousness. John who was sent, he was the only man sent with authority to baptize. There was no one else for the Lord to go unto. And yet, why did the Lord go unto this man, the Baptist? He went unto him to be baptized of him, to fulfill all righteousness, to be the sign. And it was the sign which God had said to John, when you see the Holy Spirit descend upon this man, you'll know he is the one. And when he baptized Jesus, the scriptures say, my friends, that he came straightway up out of the water, and that the Holy Spirit of God in the form of a dove, a shape of a dove, came and lighted upon him and landed upon him, and then the voice of God the Father declared from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Friends, there are those today that will not preach that, they will not teach that because they only want to say that we get only doctrine from Paul's writings. We get only our teaching from Paul's writings. And these heretics have cast aside most of the word of God. They are bringing on themselves judgment because they have taken away from the word of God. You don't actually have to take away something. You just need, if you refrain from teaching it, if you refrain from teaching the all things of God, you have fallen short of the commission, the gospel call to preach the whole counsel of God. Friends, this Baptist ministry started there. And of those whom John the Baptist baptized, Jesus chose twelve out from amongst them. Yes, twelve. All men. And they were the first ones. No women yet. Twelve men, and they were the foundation of the church at Jerusalem. The first church which Jesus built. His type of church. And then that church, those twelve, and soon others being added unto it, they baptized more, the scriptures say. They baptized more than John the Baptist did. Still the same baptism. Still Baptist baptism. Immersing the believers in water that believe the gospel message that Jesus and the twelve and then the seventy and then that the, the whole church of Jerusalem began to proclaim even on the day of Pentecost she was a church long before that day. On the beginning of that day there were 120 members of that their, their, that their church in Jerusalem and by the end of the day God had added several thousand to it. I forget now the, the five thousand, seven thousand, I forget the number. But the Lord added to that Baptist church, and they were Baptist in faith and doctrine. Not in name, yes, not in name, but in faith and in doctrine, they were Baptists. Just as we all ought to be. Now, 
We come from there down here again to the, 50, uh, to the 1600s, 1550, and the Reformed churches pop up. They have no lineage back to them. Their lineage goes into Catholicism. Church of the Antichrist, a false church, yielding itself unto men and the doctrines of men and casting aside the word of God. They did not teach a born-again theology. Just as many today, I'm sure, do not teach a born-again theology. These followers of Paul only surely don't teach this because it's not in the books of Paul. It's in the Gospels. It's the words of Jesus himself. All but those were given to Israel, they'd say. Friends, I'm warning you out there, you better take heed to this. Be careful who you're listening to out there. And if they, these hyper-dispensationalists, that's what they are, they're a hyper-dispensationalist, they do not rightly divide the Word of God. They set aside the overwhelming bulk of the Word of God and only take the books of Paul as their doctrine. They don't teach this. How could they? It'd go against their beliefs. But here again in John chapter 3, where Nicodemus comes unto the Lord... It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these things or do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, that's the first birth, and of the Spirit, that's the second birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, the first birth, born of the flesh, born of your mother's womb, born in the water of your mother's womb, that's the first birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Second birth, being born of the spirit, by the work of the Holy Spirit of God, quickening and making you alive, it has nothing to do with water baptism. Marvel not, he says, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Friends, only the Holy Spirit of God can give us the right understanding of scriptures. Only the Holy Spirit of God can show us our lost, undone condition and our need of salvation, our need of the Savior. Most of us are in this life thinking, well, we're good people. We're all right. Some of us may be on the other end of the spectrum thinking, oh, I'm such a, an evil person. I've done such terrible things. God couldn't save me because of the wickedness I've done. Well, there is no sin so great that God cannot forgive you. you can, there is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but have this comfort and assurance, friend, that you cannot do that if you're going to be a saint of God. If God has foreordained you unto salvation, if he's predetermined you to be conformed to the image of his Son, you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. God won't let you. Oh, but then we want to run off into the ideal of the freeness of man, the free will of man, his free agency. As old man is greater than God, if we begin to deceive ourselves, thinking more of ourselves than we ought. Man's heart is depraved. Man is spiritually discerned. He's in darkness. He loves darkness more than light. And when the light shined in the world, he hid himself from the darkness because we did not love the light. We loved darkness, we loved our deeds, because our deeds were evil. But the pricking of the Holy Spirit of God has drawn us unto Christ. 
We all that are alive were born the first birth, that being born in the water of our mother's womb, even as Christ was born of the mother's womb of the virgin, born of flesh and born of the water and blood. So are we all. But we are of the seed of man, and Christ is of the Father, God the Father. There's a distinction in that. That Holy Spirit of God, and it's working. That work of the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, the God the Father, who is the, who is the one who sent His only begotten Son into this world to fulfill all things, even to the very death of the cross, where the shedding of his blood will redeem all the saints of God, yes, all of the saints, that's those that are saved, have been saved, and will be saved, and all the wicked, the ungodly, the wicked, the God has said, I have no love for them, I hate them. They shall perish, go unto hell. For they will not receive this. They close their eyes to it. They close their ears to it. They refuse to see. They refuse to hear. Least they be saved. That's the very words of Christ himself. What he said about the wicked. They choose not to see. They choose not to hear. But thanks be unto God. The Holy Spirit moveth it goeth wheresoever it will. And to the people that God has said this one, this one, and this one. Yes, in the true sense of it, he said, save this one, save that one, save this one. I'm pre he's predestinated those to be conformed to the image of his son. All were condemned already, all of us. All of us condemned and would be rightly sent unto hell itself if we received what we deserve. But the Holy Spirit came and began to prick our hearts, began to burden us with this understanding that we were sinners. The law. Oh, the law, they said, oh, but it was just given to Israel. It doesn't pertain to us. Well, then there is no sin, is there? For where there is no law, there is no sin. Heretics who deny that the law is given and all the world may become guilty before God, not just the Jews, but also we Gentiles. The law given that that Holy Spirit might then take it and show us by the law our lost, undone condition before God, being ungodly sinners, deserving of the wrath of God, being deserving of a just and righteous judgment because we are sinners. By nature, by practice, by desire. We desire to do that which is against God. But the Holy Spirit goeth wheresoever it will. It bloweth, he says, and the wind bloweth, whether it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. You can't tell where the wind's coming from or where it's going. You can't tell who's going to be saved in the multitudes that hear the word of God. It's not possible. God knows. God knows and knew he's known from the very foundation of the world everyone that would be saved throughout the fullness of time. And it's not of them, it's of God. God determining their salvation. God determining the very end of things that they would be there in that new heaven and new earth before the foundation of the world. He determined that. He determined their salvation. And in time, the Holy Spirit has come and moved upon them one by one and drawn them unto Christ, drawn them unto God in faith and belief that they would believe the Word of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't use anything else. doesn't use uh, strange occurrences, funny emotional feelings, uh, dreams within us anymore. No, there were God spoken dreams in times past, in days of old, but not anymore. But in and through this here word of God, which we preach unto you, the necessity that we be born again. This is the working of God. Not a one of us had a say in our physical birth. When it came time and God formed us in the belly of our mothers, we did not have an opportunity to make a checklist. Well, I'd like this color of hair, this color of eyes, this height, this color. 
this physical shape, no. We do not and could not add and cannot even now add under the height of our cells. We cannot control the hairs upon our head, what color they are, or whether or not they're going to stay in. We have not this privilege. It was God who determined our existence that we would be born and come into this sinful world, being born in sin, shaping in iniquity, it says, born from the sinful parents that we have, who our lineage goes all the way back to Adam, who sinned against God, and in him we all fail. No, we're not accountable for Adam's sin. This also is heresy. Roman Catholicism teaches that we are accountable for Adam's sin, and that's why they think babies need to be baptized. A baby has no sin of its own yet. It's not lived long enough to sin. It's not lived long enough to understand what sin is, and what the law is, and what God is, and what faith is. Where there is no understanding, there is no sin. Where there is no law or understanding of law, there is no sin. But yet, death reigns in us all. We all will die. We'll all perish. We must be born again. The first birth is physical. The birth is not baptism. It's not baptism in water. And I say this again, that all those that teach baptismal regeneration are teaching that the blood of Jesus Christ is not sufficient to save you from all your sins. You're saved by the grace of God. Unmerited favor is what that is. Through faith, not in any works, but through faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And to step back from that and begin to deny that Jesus did this and did that and, and say, well, He didn't have to fulfill the law. He didn't have to fulfill the prophecies. That's to deny Him as Christ. He had to fulfill all those things and He did. He fulfilled all the scriptures that related to his appearing. This is what those people of Israel, the religious leaders, this man Nicodemus being a man of such high position in Israel should have known the scriptures. He should have saw in the life of Jesus and how he's coming forth. and He should have been able to piece it together by the Lord of God. But he, he he could not see these things except he be born again. Not only can you not enter it, but you can't see it. You must be born again to be able to see these things. That's being saved by the grace of God. That Holy Spirit going on to each and every one that God has preordained, predetermined, that they be conformed to the image of his Son, it has to go to each of them and say to them in proper order and fashion, when it's appointed of God. You cannot be saved too late. You cannot be saved too early. But right at the right time, you're born. You do not enter into this world too soon or too late. You entered into this world exactly when God appointed you to be born of the flesh into this world, being born of water, the, the water of your mother's womb. As John states it, born of water and blood. That natural birth that Jesus Christ himself had. No, Jesus did not need to be born again. He did not need to be saved. He was the only begotten Son of God. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He had no sin nature. He only had a divine, holy nature. Being in a human body made for him. See, what tells this body what to do? What, what is it that governs this body? It's our nature, my friend. It's not your will. You think your will is. You, your free will is your ability to choose left or right. On the one hand is wickedness. On the other hand is righteousness. But the heart's spiritually deceived. Heart's de is desperately wicked. Man's in, <laughs> heart's desperately wicked and man is de spiritually discerned. That's what scripture says. Paul said, oh wretched man that I am. See, the heart desires that which is wicked, and the flesh does too. 
the heart doesn't desire the righteousness, neither does the flesh. The eyes look upon the world with lustful desire, desiring what we see therein. When we look upon righteousness, we see foolishness. We see nothing profitable. Why then do men turn from wickedness to righteousness? By the working of the Holy Spirit within us, pricking our hearts, turning us from one to the other, that we might see ourselves lost and undone without God or His Son, without hope in the world, condemned by the Word of God as sinners, ungodly sinners, who have lived for self and self only, we must crucify self. We must die to self and be born again by the working of the Holy Spirit within us which brings us unto Christ and yes, quickens and makes us alive spiritually and so we can see these things and we can believe these things and that we can look to righteousness which is in Jesus Christ and trust in Him and His finished work. Nicodemus answered and said, How can these things be? This is the power and the working of God. This is not of the flesh. This is not of man. This is of God. God who created all things and could have went about this a million different ways, but by the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel, Preaching the word of God, he has chosen to make known unto lost, undone men their condition before him, being sinners, being under the rightly judgment, right judgment of the word of God, that we are, being sinners, we are right to be judged. We should be judged. We should be condemned. We should go to hell. But God's unmerited favor toward us, God's grace toward us, would not allow it. He foreordained and predetermined our salvation in and through Jesus Christ. Not through any other man, not through any works, not through any religion, but through Christ and belief in Him is a part of that new birth. Look and live. Even as the serpent was lifted up out in the wilderness and all those that looked to the serpent and believed that they would heal them, they were healed. And all those that look to Christ and believe that he'll save them are saved. How can these things be? Jesus answered said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? As a man in his position, I believe he was required to know the word. He was required to know the writings of God, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, all those things of God. Certainly the first those five books of the Bible, those books of the law, he was required to know all that. It's in them. The plans and the patterns of salvation unto God are there, that without the shedding of blood there is no redemption. The shedding of blood is to be of that spotless Lamb of God. Well, God declared he had no pleasure in sacrifices. not possible that all the blood of bulls and goats could take away the sins of man. No, not even the sins of one person. Only by the righteous Lamb of God, the only begotten Son of God, and His shed blood on the cross of Calvary. Yes, they crucified the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. They crucified the Lamb of God on Calvary. But my friends, we need to make a distinction. They did not kill him. They could not take his life. They could not end his life. They could only crucify him to that tree, to that cross. They could only nail it to it. They could only nail him to the cross. That there Roland Satarian, if he'd have been allowed to come along and to break the legs and spear him in the side, he still could have lived through all of that. Because you cannot take the life of God. But Jesus said, I lay it down that I might take it up again. He gave up his life. He, at the moment when he said it's fulfilled, all is fulfilled, right then and there, the 
fulfillment of all prophecy and all things that had been fulfilled of the law, the prophets, and the psalms. Everything that was to be done had been done. Even to the shedding of blood on the cross as it came forth from the wounds in his hands and the wounds in his feet. But see, it's all supposed to flow out. They were coming to break the legs. And if he had not given up the life in that body, they would have broke the legs and violated the prophecies and he would have ceased to be the Savior. They couldn't break the legs because prophecy said the legs would not be broken. Not one bone would be broken, the prophecy said. So he gave up the life in that body. He yielded up the life and allowed the body to die. And they come along and say, it looks like he's dead. So one centurion spears him. Someone that was even a person that's passed out is going to react to that. No reaction. Definitely did. Wow. No normal human being would die so quick, especially being in such good physical condition as he was. Out flowed the blood and the water. Fulfilling scripture. It was done. It was satisfied right then and there. The law was satisfied. The grace of God was satisfied. And to the grave. Three days and three nights. Fulfilling all things. After three days and three nights, three 24-hour days, he arose from the grave, ascended up to the throne of the Father, to stand before him. His Father was well pleased. All had been accomplished. All the attempts of hell and Satan and the devils had failed. They fell short. They could not stop this. Oh, yes, Nicodemus should have seen it. He should have seen it coming. Should have seen the signs. He was a master of Israel. He should have known what the Word of God said. He should have been looking for the signs. Oh, yes, another prophet, another man of God. Because God's with him, because we can tell by the miracles. He goes on to say in verse 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. My friends, how many is it today that have not received the witness of God, have not believed? And I'm already out of time to appear here. Time's ticking down fast. I do pray that God would bless you all and keep you in the faith, and that God would help us. God would help us to help me to continue to set before you the truth of God's Word and teach these things that we might see the changes in history. To where that men begin to corrupt the Word of God and teach those things that are not according to Scriptures, where they begin to even deny the truth, deny the way of salvation, to corrupt the way of salvation, to add to it, to take away from it. Friends, we must be born again. And that is a working of the Holy Spirit within us to quicken, make us alive, to give us the gift of faith. That whereas we have looked away, we've closed our eyes to the Word of God, we've shut our ears. The Spirit of God pries open the eyes and the ears and says, look here, listen to this. Pricking our hearts and bringing us unto Christ in repentance and faith. Giving us the gift of God, which is faith and salvation in the Lord. And God bless and keep you, my friends, till we meet again.